Hi, I'm Jessica, the branch director at the Trail Memorial Library, and this is chapter 12 of The Secret of Chimneys, titled Anthony Tells His Story. Mr. Anthony Cade, announced Treadwell. Enter a suspicious stranger from Village Inn, said Anthony. He made his way towards Lord Caterham with a kind of instinct rare in strangers. At the same time, he summed up the other three men in his own mind thus. One, Scotland Yard, two, local dignitary, probably chief constable, three, harassed gentlemen on the verge of apoplexy, possibly connected with the government. I must apologize, continued Anthony, still addressing Lord Caterham, for forcing my way in like this, I mean, but it was rumored round the Jolly Dog or whatever the name of your local pub may be that you had had a murder up here and as I thought I might be able to throw some light upon it, I came along. For a moment or two, no one spoke. Superintendent Battle, because he was a man of ripe experience who knew how infinitely better it was to let everyone else speak if they could be persuaded upon to do so, Colonel Melrose, because he was habitually taciturn, George, because he was in the habit of having notice given to him of the question, Lord Caterham, because he had not the least idea of what to say. The silence of the other three, however, and the fact that he had been directly addressed, finally forced speech upon the last name. Uh, quite so, quite so, he said nervously. Won't you uh, um, sit down? Thank you, said Anthony. George cleared his throat portentously. <clears> or <throat> er, when you say you can throw upon this matter, you mean, I mean, said Anthony, that I was trespassing upon Lord Caterham's property, for which I hope he will forgive me, last night at about 11.45, and that I actually heard the shot fired. I can at any rate fix the time of the crime for you. He looked round at the three in turn, his eyes resting longest on Superintendent Battle, the impassivity of whose face he seemed to appreciate. But I hardly think that's, that's news to you, he added gently. Meaning by that, Mr. Cade? asked Battle. Just this. I put on shoes when I got up this morning. Later, when I asked for my boots, I couldn't have them. Some nice young constable had called round for them, so I naturally put two and two together and hurried up here to clear my character if possible. A very sensible move, said Battle noncommittally. Anthony's eyes twinkled a little. I appreciate your reticence, Inspector. It is Inspector, isn't it? Lord Caterham interposed. He was beginning to take a fancy to Anthony. Superintendent Battle of Scotland Yard, this is Colonel Melrose, our Chief Constable, and Mr. Lomax. Anthony looked sharply at George. Mr. George Lomax? Yes. I think, Mr. Lomax, said Anthony, that I had the pleasure of receiving a letter from you today, from yesterday. George stared at him. I think not, he said coldly. But he wished that Miss Oscar were here. Miss Oscar wrote all his letters for him and remembered who they were to and what they were about. A great man like George could not possibly remember all these annoying details. I think, Mr. Cade, he hinted, that you were about to give us some er, explanation of what you were doing in the grounds last night at 11.45. His tone said plainly, and whatever it may be, we are not likely to believe it. Yes, Mr. Cade, what were you doing? said Lord Caterham with lively interest. Well, said Anthony regretfully, I'm afraid it's rather a long story. He drew out his cigarette case. May I? Lord Caterham nodded and Anthony lit a cigarette and braced himself for the ordeal. He was aware none better of the peril in which he stood. In the short space of 24 hours, he had become embroiled in two separate crimes. His actions in connection with the first would not bear looking into for a second. After deliberately disposing of one body and so defeating the aims of justice, he had arrived upon the scene of the second crime at the exact moment when it was being committed. For a young man looking for trouble, he could hardly have done better. South America, thought Anthony to himself, simply isn't in simply isn't in it with this. He had already decided upon his course of action. He was going to tell the truth when, with one trifling alteration and one grave suppression. The story begins, said Anthony, about three weeks ago in Balawahu, 
Mr. Lomax, of course, knows where that is, outpost of the empire. What do we know of England who only England know? All that sort of thing. I was conversing with a friend of mine, a Mr. James McGrath. He brought out the name slowly with a thoughtful eye on George. George bounded in his seat and repressed an exclamation with difficulty. The upshot of our conversation was that I came to England to carry out a little commission for Mr. McGrath, who was unable to go himself. Since the passage was booked in his name, I traveled as James McGrath. I don't know what particular kind of offense that was. The superintendent can tell me, I dare say, and run me in for so many months hard if necessary. We'll get on with the story, if you please, sir, said Battle, but his eyes twinkled a little. On arrival in London, I went to the Blitz Hotel, still as James McGrath. My business in London was to deliver a certain manuscript to a firm of publishers, but almost immediately I received deputations from the representatives of two political parties of a foreign kingdom. The methods of one were strictly constitutional, the methods of the other were not. I dealt with them both accordingly, but my troubles were not over. That night my room was broken into and an attempt at burglary was made by one of the waiters at the hotel. That was not reported to the police, I think, said Superintendent Battle. You're right, it was not. Nothing was taken, you see. But I did report the occurrence to the manager of the hotel, and he will confirm my story and tell you that the waiter in question decamped rather abruptly in the middle of the night. The next day, the publishers rang me up and suggested that one of their representatives would call upon me and receive the mass manuscript. I agreed to this, and the arrangement was duly carried out on the following morning. Since I have heard nothing further, I presume the manuscript reached them safely. Yesterday, still as James McGrath, I received a letter from Mr. Lomax. Anthony paused. He was by now beginning to enjoy himself. George shifted uneasily. I remember, he murmured, such a large correspondence. The name, of course, being different, I could not be expected to know. And I may say, George's voice rose a little from an assurance of moral stability, that this is, this, this masquerading as another man in the highest degree improper. I have no doubt, no doubt whatever, that you have incurred a severe legal penalty. In this letter, continued Anthony unmoved, Mr. Lomax made various suggestions concerning the manuscript in my charge. He also extended an invitation to me from Lord Caterham to join the house party here. Delighted to see you, my dear fellow, said the nobleman. Better late than never, eh? George frowned at him. Superintendent Battle bent an unmoved eye upon Anthony. And is that your explanation for your presence here last night, sir? He asked. Certainly not, said Anthony warmly. When I am asked to stay at a country house, I don't scale the wall late at night, tramp across the park, and try the downstairs window. I drive up to the front door, ring the bell, and wipe my feet on the mat. I will proceed. I replied to Mr. Lomax's letter, explaining that the manuscript had passed out of my keeping, and therefore regretfully declining Lord Caterham's kind invitation. But after I had done so, I remembered something which had up till then escaped my memory. He paused. The moment had come for skating over thin ice. I must tell you that in my struggle with the waiter Giuseppe, I had wrested from him a small bit of paper with some words scribbled on it. They had conveyed nothing to me at the time, but I still had them, and the mention of chimneys recalled them to me. I got the torn scrap out and looked at it. It was as I had thought. Here is the piece of paper, gentlemen, you can see for yourselves. The words on it are chimneys, 1145, Thursday. Battle examined the paper attentively. Of course, continued Anthony, the word chimneys might have nothing to do with this house. On the other hand, it might, and undoubtedly this Giuseppe was a thieving rascal. I made up my mind to motor down here last night, satisfy myself that all was as it should be, put up at the inn, and call upon Lord Caterham in the morning and put him on his guard in case some mischief should be intended during the weekend. Quite so, said Lord Caterham encouragingly, quite so. I was late getting here, had not allowed enough time. Consequently, I stopped the car, climbed over the wall, and ran across the park. When I arrived on the terrace, the whole house was dark and silent. I was just turning away when I heard the shot. I fancied that it came from inside the house, and I ran back, crossed the terrace, and tried the windows. But they were fastened, and there was no sound of any kind from inside the house. I waited a while, but the whole place was as still as the grave, so I made up my mind that I had made a mistake, and that what I had heard was a stray poacher. Quite natural conclusion to come to under the circumstances, I think. Quite natural said Superin 
intended battle expressionlessly. I went on to the inn, put up as I said, and heard the news this morning. I realized, of course, that I was a suspicious character, bound to be under the circumstances, and came up here to tell my story, hoping it wasn't going to be handcuffs for one. There was a pause. Colonel Melrose looked sideways at Superintendent Battle. I think the story seems clear enough, he remarked. Yes, said Battle. I don't think we'll be handing out any handcuffs this morning. Any questions, Battle? There's one thing I'd like to know. What was the manuscript? He looked across at George and the latter replied with a trace of unwillingness. Memoirs of the late Count Stillpitch. You see, you needn't say anything more, said Battle. I was, I see perfectly. He turned to Anthony. Do you know who it was that was shot, Mr. Cade? At the Jolly Dog, it was understood to be a Count Stanislaus or some such name. Tell him said Battle laconically to George Lomax. George was clearly reluctant, but he was forced to speak. The gentleman who was staying here incognito as Count Stanislaus was His Highness Prince Michael of Slovakia. Anthony whistled. <laughs> that must be deuced awkward, he remarked. Superintendent Battle, who had been watching Anthony closely, gave a short grunt as though satisfied of something and rose abruptly to his feet. There are one or two questions I'd like to ask Mr. Cade, he announced. I'll take him into the council chamber with me if I may. Certainly, certainly, said Lord Caterham. Take him anywhere you like. Anthony and the detective went out together. The body had been moved from the scene of the tragedy. There was a dark stain on the floor where it had lain, but otherwise there was nothing to suggest that a tragedy had ever occurred. The sun poured in through the three windows, flooding the room with light and bringing out the mellow tone of the old paneling. Anthony looked round him with approval. Very nice, he commented. Nothing much to beat old England, is there? Did it seem to you at first that it was in this room the shot was fired? Asked the superintendent, not replying to Anthony's eulogium. Let me see. Anthony opened the window and went out on the terrace, looking up at the house. Yes, that's the room all right, he said. It's built out and occupies all the corner. If he shot, if the shot had been fired anywhere else, it would have sounded from the left, but this was from behind me or to the right, if anything. That's why I thought of poachers. It's at the extremity of the wing, you see. He stepped back across the threshold and asked suddenly as though the idea had just struck him. Why do you ask? You know he was shot here, don't you? Ha <laughs> said the superintendent. We never know as much as we'd like to know, but yes, he was shot here all right. Now you said something about trying the windows, didn't you? Yes, they were fastened from the inside. How many of them did you try? All three of them. Sure of that, sir? I'm in the habit of being sure. Why do you ask? That's a funny thing, said the superintendent. What's a funny thing? When the crime was discovered this morning, the middle one was open, not latched, that is to say. Phew! said Anthony, sinking down on the window seat and taking out his cigarette case. That's rather a blow. That opens up quite a different aspect of the case. It leaves us two alternatives. Either he was killed by someone in the house and that someone unlatched the window after I had gone to make it look like an outside job, incidentally, with me as little Willie, or else not to mince matters, I'm lying. I dare say you incline to the second possibility, but upon my honor, you're wrong. Nobody's going to leave this house until I'm through with them, I can tell you that, said Superintendent Battle grimly. Anthony looked at him keenly. How long have you had the idea that it might be an inside job, he asked. Battle smiled. I've had a notion that way all along. Your trail was a bit too flaring, if I may put it that way. As soon as your boots fitted the footmarks, I began to have my doubts. I congratulate Scotland Yard, said Anthony lightly. But at that moment, the moment when Battle apparently admitted Anthony's complete absence of complicity in the crime, Anthony felt more than ever the need of being upon his guard. Superintendent Battle was a very astute officer. It would not do to make any slip with Superintendent Battle about. That's where it happened, I suppose, said Anthony, nodding towards the dark patch upon the floor. Yes. What was he shot with? A revolver? Yes, but we shan't know what make until they get the bullet out at the autopsy. 
It wasn't found then? No, it wasn't found. No clues of any kind? Well, we've got this. Rather after the manner of a conjurer, Superintendent Battle produced a half sheet of note paper, and as he did so, he again watched Anthony closely without seeming to do so. But Anthony recognized the design upon it without any sign of consternation. Ha <laughs> ha! Comrades of the Red Hand again! If they're going to scatter this sort of thing about, they ought to have it lithographed. It must be a frightful nuisance doing everyone separately. Where was this found? Underneath the body. You've seen it before, sir? Anthony recounted to him in detail his short encounter with that public spirited association. The idea is, I suppose, that the comrades did it in. Do you think it likely, sir? Well, it would be in keeping with their propaganda, but I've always found that those who talk about most about blood have never naturally seen it run. I shouldn't have said the comrades with the guts myself, and they're such picturesque people too. I don't see one of them disguising himself as a suitable guest for a country house. Still, one never knows. Quite right, Mr. Cade, one never knows. Anthony looked suddenly amused. I see the big idea now, open window, trail of footprints, suspicious stranger at the village inn, but I can assure you, my dear superintendent, that whatever I am, I am not the local agent of the Red Hand. Superintendent Battle smiled a little, then he played his last card. Would you have any objection to seeing the body? He shot out suddenly. None whatever, rejoined Anthony. Battle took a key from his pocket and preceding Anthony down the corridor, paused at a door and unlocked it. It was one of the smaller drawing rooms. The body lay on a table covered with a sheet. Superintendent Battle waited on until Anthony was beside him and then whisked away the sheet suddenly. An eager light sprang into his eyes as the half uttered exclamation and the start of surprise which the other gave. So you do recognize him, Mr. Cade, he said in a voice that strove to render devoid of triumph. I've seen him before, yes, said Anthony, recovering himself, but not as Prince Michael Obalovich. He purported to come from Mr. Balderson and Hodgkins, and he called himself Mr. Holmes.